We have, uh, things are getting really tough in the world, you know. It's not like that's just brand new. Things have been tough in this planet for a long, long time. You know, it, it's ebbs and flows, you know. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. But now it's, it seems like it's getting to a, re point, a point of no return. We're getting very close. And of course, God said that this would happen. Uh, a lot of people all the way through history thought that, uh, you know, if they're Christian, they thought that they, they were living in the last days, and it didn't happen. And it's easy for us to think now that it's not going to happen. But um, I don't know. It sure looks like everything that can be done has been done. Um, so what we need to do, though, I keep, I keep telling everybody what Jesus said sufficient to today, the problems they're in, you know? And uh, it's, it's more important that we focus on today than we worry about tomorrow, right? And to realize that we're very fortunate because we have a loving God who has told us that he'll take on the battle for us. And all we have to do is focus on him and not ourselves. So what he did was he came here and he left as an example as well as bringing atonement so that we could have a relationship with our creator. He also, he also left us an example, a very powerful example. And he said, what I do, you can do also. All you need to do is surrender to me. Ask me. Ask me into your life. And that's what we do. And when we do that, we become renewed. We become brand new creatures. Now, you know, you look the same, you sound the same, but you see the world differently, don't you? And your, your vision has moved beyond the horizon. You're seeing way past what you ever saw before because now you have a new mind. And that new mind is, you know, people talk about the sixth sense and ESP and extra sensory perception. Well, to a Christian, it's the Holy Spirit. That's an extra sensory perception. A sensory perception that comes through our spirit from God. So I want to talk about renewal today and a few things that we need to know about renewal. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was, was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Romans 6 verse 4. Romans 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That is, we have been identified with Jesus. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He made the offer. All we have to do is receive it. And that reception isn't passive. It's active. You have to reach out and take it. Amen? Amen. Somebody can offer you a million dollars. It's not yours until you take it. God's not one that's going to throw it on you. You've got to reach out and take it. That's right, Lambana. In Christ Jesus, all things become new. And only in Christ Jesus do all things become new. There is no other way. But how many of us are stuck in some past condition or identify with some past situation? I can't get past my past. You know? It's, it's a great weight chained to my ankle. I can't move beyond it. There are so many people like that. And you know one of the reasons for that is because they're so focused on self. And fear and worry. This is one of the tools that the devil uses 
to accuse and to condemn. You know, he is a, confu confu uh, a confuser. He is, he is an accuser and a condemner. You know, in contrast, God doesn't condemn. What does God do, Kabil? He can fix. He can fix. You know what the difference is between condemnation and conviction? Conviction is, oh, David, do you realize what you just did? The devil would say, you got to burn for what you just did. But God says, do you realize what you just did? And then I can say, yes, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me never to do it again. That's the difference between condemnation and conviction. Amen. It is said that he who lives in the past denies himself a future. In John 8, verses 31 to 32, John 8, 31 to 32, Jesus said to those who Jews who believed him, the Jews who believed him, not everybody did, but there were a lot who did believe him. He said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the truth that sets us free is the word of God. And you know what? Jesus said, you can't just visit it. You can't just read it. You got to live in it. Abide. Abide means live in, right? If you live in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, the devil is really good at hiding the truth. So much of what he says, there is truth buried in it. But without the discernment that comes only through the Holy Spirit, you won't see the lie that it's wrapped up in. In Luke 6, verse 46, Luke 6, verse 46, Jesus said, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, there's a lot of that in the church. Jesus tells us things not to lord it over us, although he is our Lord, right? You know what the word Lord means? Lord comes from an old English term. It means the provider of the loaf, the provider of the loaf, the provider of the bread, right? He is the provider of the bread. And he gives us, we would call them orders, but they're not really orders. They're actually suggestions that we better pay attention to. Right? He says, why do you call me your provider and do not accept what I've given you? That's pretty much what he's saying. So people think about obedience, obedience. You know, you've heard me say on many occasions, I, I take the word obedience and I, I change it to following. Hmm? Guidance, yes, thank you. To follow him. To be guided by him. Well, when we see the word obedience, somehow in our, in our human spirit, our carnal nature, we resist that. We, resist, we stand firm. Obe obey? Obey? Well, there are two Greek words translated obey. One means to conform to authority or suffer the consequences. Conform to authority or suffer the consequences. And that word, and if anybody wants to look it up, it's Greek um, in the Strong's lexicon, 3980. Number 3980. And it's pethakeo. Pethakeo. Now, ak, when you see ak, it generally means an authority. 
And it's really talking about suffer the consequences if you don't listen to this guy directing you into what you're supposed to do. The other one is to be persuaded, to be persuaded. And this is an act of free will. You don't have to, you know, but if you're pers persuaded, you most certainly will. You'll follow the directions. And that comes from Greek 3982, Pitheo. So it's really important that we understand that God does not force his will upon you. He persuades, right? If you're smart, you get persuaded. Abiding in his word brings transformation and it frees us from sin. We're freed from sin as we're transformed. Transformation is to prepare us for an eternity in the presence of a holy God. And not only does it prepare us for an eternity in the presence of a holy God, it equips us to rise above the problems in the fallen world. It frees us to do what he desires us to do. When, when we're transformed, his desires become our desires. You know, it's kind of like people don't know. Well, I don't know if I want to, you know, accept him because then I won't be able to do the things I want to do. I say, wait a minute. If you accept him and you're transformed, you'll only do those things you want to do because they'll be the same things he wants you to do. Amen? Amen. So, it, you know, it's a win-win situation, really, coming, accepting him on his terms. Abiding in his word brings transformation and frees us from sin, which is the weakness that keeps us earthbound and victims to the trials and tribulations of this fallen world. And it will free us to life and to joy unspeakable if we listen to him. Listening isn't just a matter of hearing with the ear. It's a matter of accepting with the mind and with the heart. Amen? Now the Word of God reveals many things to us. It is our window to reality and exposes all the illusions of earthly life. And one of the greatest illusions in life is that we are compelled to be shaped by our experiences. Human wisdom dictates that we are each the product of everything that has happened to us a construct of years of, of actions and reactions, of failures and disappointments. Isn't that true? Yeah. I remember this morning Gracie said, there was a time when I thought that I was nothing. And then Jesus came into my life, right? Amen. Did he? And I realized that what I am is not my past. It's not my failures. It's not what other people say of me. It's what my creator, creator God says of me. And he says, I love you with an everlasting love. And nothing will separate you from me. Human wisdom dictates that we are each a product of our past. But Proverbs 23, 7 assures us, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If we believe that we can only be what our experiences make us, we remain slaves to our past and to our circumstances. And if we serve our circumstances, we cannot serve God. Right? Matthew 6:24. It clearly states that no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You know, the devil 
is very involved in keeping you in that situation. He wants you to focus on your failures. He wants you to focus on all those things that you would rather not have had a part in. Oh, I don't like, like the way I look. Uh, I don't like where I live. I, you know, there are so many things that we can focus on that take away meaning for us, take away joy. And what we need to do is start praising God, thanking God. And the weirdest thing will happen. When you start praising Him and thanking Him, you start to see things differently. You see yourself differently. You see your circumstances differently. This is a true statement. If anyone thinks that no one serves circumstances, I remind you that many a person is absolutely trapped in some past event that adversely affects his or her life in the present. Here's one. Unforgiveness. How about that? Unforgiveness, which does more damage to the offended person than it does to the one who offended them. Unforgiveness will eat you up on the inside. This is why Romans 12.2 warns us. Remember Romans 12.2? It's up there. One of my favorite verses. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, that you may become a manifestation of God's holy will. That's what it means. Be transformed by His Holy Spirit, by the intake of Bible, of the Word of God. Feed on it. Devour it. What you eat is what you will become. And when you do that, you will be changed to the point where you will become a manifestation of God's will. And like I said, you will be able to do anything you want to do. Total freedom. Because you only want to do those things which your new nature says it wants to do. Amen? If we are not transformed in our minds to God's mind, connected to God, right? The example again, if you've got two tuning forks and they're both at the same frequency, you separate them by... A hundred feet, you strike one, the other one will vibrate in harmony, in sympathy. Okay? And that's the same thing for us with the Holy Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit in you, when Christ is your Lord as well as your Savior, His mind and your mind are in tune with each other. We are not shackled to our past and unable to enjoy the present to the extent that God intends us to. You know, there is an illusion that we are connected to our past and our circumstances. And for that reason, a lot of people live lives of quiet desperation and failure. They can't go anywhere. Like I said, it's a threat to your future. But you know, Jesus said in Matthew 6.34, Matthew 6.34 says, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus told us that we can break free of the mold of experience and enjoy life without guilt without anger, and without resentment. And this is a time of renewal, to let the past be behind us and enjoy the journey that God has set before us in Christ Jesus. It is a journey. It's a journey. And in that journey, you're going to find, in that journey, you're going to find little uh, obstacles to go around. You, go, you can go around them. You can go over them. They won't stop you. Your progress, you know, you're, you're sheep, right? 
right? You're a proton. You put the foot forward. You continue to move ahead. We keep our eyes on the prize, which is Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Glory, which is value. That's what glory means, kabod in the Greek, it, or in the Hebrew at least. It means value, value. Our value is found not in our circumstances, not in our past. It's not even found in our abilities. You know that? Our value, true value, real value, that lasts for eternity, is found in Christ Jesus. You have the greatest talents in the world. You know, I was watching on YouTube uh, yesterday, this girl, I, she's a foreign girl of some sort. I don't know, don't know where she's from, but there's a pretty girl, and she's probably about, what, maybe 20, 22, 23. A juggler? Do you talk about mesmerizing? This, I, I almost wish I put this up for people to see. It's astounding. She'd take, what would it be, about eight or nine balls? And she just dug it, and her hands are moving so fast. Okay, don't tell me that. I, she's, she's juggling, and then she does a spin around and still juggling, and, and she's got this uh, reflector board uh, so that they, they'll come down, hit one side, go up the other, and then, and she's standing in the middle, and she's juggling these things. I think, this is, a, this is more than a talent. This is a gift. This is a gift. And I'm, I'm, I told Camille, a man couldn't do this. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I know there are men that juggle, but I've never seen a man juggle like this. I don't think a man could juggle like this because they can only think with one side of their brain at once. <laughs> Women can think with both sides of their brain at once. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank God for that. <laughs> What, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> because I only need one side of my brain. <laughs> oh, really? Ladies, you have this, this tremendous advantage over us. You have a, a thing called the corpus callosum, which is in the middle of the brain, running from front to back, and it's the transmitter between the hemispheres, your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere. Uh, the right hemisphere is more for uh, logic and the left hemisphere is more for poetry and art and so on. Uh, and, and why is it? Why is it God gave you guys that? Because you're mothers. You're mothers. Really. And mothers have to do, have to do a lot yeah, as wives, they have to do a lot, too, I know. <laughs> now, don't misuse your ability, okay? All right, just remember, you are a help meet, right? And you know what meet means? It's an old English term. It means perfectly suitable mate. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Camille wants to add something. What? What are you gonna turn it on? This turn. was just sent to me. I sent it to Nikki. Did you read it, what I sent you last evening? Someone sent this to me that said, "How come in the Bible um, men always had to go up to the mountain to seek God?" But women never go up to the mountain to seek God. When you look through the Bible, and I'm still trying to think, God always met women where they were. They were always working, they were doing something, they were pre and I'll, I'll put it out there on, on Shepherd's Lighthouse. So not to demean men or anything, but it was just interesting that God always just in, intervened with women with what they were doing because they're so busy. But men had to go away to be with the Lord. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I am go I'm going to celebrate what women are, and I'm going to celebrate what men are. 
okay? And the one is not fil fulfilled without the other, by golly. Amen? Amen. Now that's provided the man do what he's supposed to as a husband, and the woman does what she is supposed to as a wife. And when they do that, guess who is with them? The Lord Jesus is with them. Amen? You know, even before they get, even before they get saved, I think he's still there. You know, saying, yeah, come, be with me. Yep, the spill, still small voice. So anyway, as I said, this is a time of renewal. So guilt, anger, and resentment are waiting for all those who believe themselves to be a result, result of this experience. And you know, there's this a word, it's called synergy. Synergy is a word that means the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You are greater than the sum of your experiences and your, your failures, your successes, none of that. You are greater than all of that. Be careful what you identify with. Don't identify with failure. Don't even, in fact, don't even identify with the past. Keep your eyes on the future. And spend your time in the presence, in the present. I have heard people on the radio talking about how they deal with unpleasant past experiences. They, the experiences they were talking about include such things as domestic violence, abuse, incest, rape, and all manner of mean and nasty things. They insisted in that taking, that talking about these unpleasant and traumatic experiences was therapeutic and helped them to deal with the scars left by them. But I truly believe that this is not true. I wonder just how much benefit is derived from reliving an unpleasant past. Psychologists believe that harmful memories can be discharged by rendering uh, by, and rendered harmless by talking about them. And this reminds me of the auditing method of Scientology. You all know about Scientology? L. Ron Hubbard started that. Um, and I think, he, I think he died around 1983 or somewhere around there. Uh, here's a psychologist. Do you know the psychologist actually started Scientology? This is quite fitting. I remember I, when I went to New Zealand back in, oh, I'm not going to even say the year. I was on my way back to the States from Australia and I stopped at, uh, I had a, a layover in New Zealand um, and I ended up staying there. Uh, I was uh, walking the main street in the city and there was a, a little storefront and uh, it had something about IQ test in it. Uh, you know, I thought, I'll go in and check this out. It was, it was Scientology. And they give you a little IQ test, right? And what they're trying to do is find out how they can get to you. Well, as a result, I ended up uh, with uh, an auditing. Auditing is what they call sitting you down with a lie detector and asking you questions. And they watch the lie detector. They call it an e-meter. You're holding these canisters. And uh, they ask you questions. And they're looking at this e-meter and they're determining whether you're telling the truth or whether you're not telling the truth. Plus, they got some other ideas going, I think. And their idea is this, that they're going to find out what they called engrams, which are fixation, fixations and complexes that you bring over with you from previous lives, right? And by then determining what complex or fixation, which they call engrams, you've brought over with you, they're going to use the cross-examining and uh, uh, they're going to talk you out of them is probably the best way to put it. Um, and what, they, what they're doing is they're trying to clear you. You become a clear. 
um, who was it uh, in uh, Tom, oh, what's his last name? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is the greatest example of a clear. And he, he is a big wheel in, uh, in Scientology. You all know that? Yeah. He's very involved with Scientology. And I'll tell you what, you look at this guy and his accomplishments and you've got to say, hmm, maybe there's something to this. But don't be fooled. Yeah. You're not going to discharge your past by interrogation and you're not going to discharge your past by reliving your past. All you do is you give life to those pasts those things that need to be gone, and you end up with zombies. And I think this is one of the problems that, with psychology. I know I had to write a research paper on psychology in, in, um, in seminary, and uh, it, they didn't like my research paper. Uh, said, you know, the thing is that psychologists try to get you con conform to the world, uh, or adjust you to the world. And uh, Christ conforms you to the Lord, to the God. You know, there's a big difference there. So I recall, I, I believe that in recalling evil events and experiences, rather than removing them, we give them a brand new life and they become instruments that the devil skillfully uses to systematically demolish our lives. Psychologists have developed all sorts of techniques to bring about closure through the externalization of memories that is bringing them out into the open. But 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, old things become new. You know what that means? It means that with Jesus in your life, all the unpleasant things that you have been carrying around with you actually happen to somebody you used to be. They happen to somebody else. And you no longer have to struggle through life with guilt, anger, or resentment. Christ has removed the burden from you. He has set you free to be you. He has declared that you are not your past. Behold, all things have become new in Christ. Remember that Jesus sees us as much greater than the sum of our experiences. We can find all sorts of reasons to, and rebuttals to validate our preoccupation with past failures and disappointments. For one thing, they can justify our falling short of our expectations. Got to be careful of that. Making excuses for your failures. You don't need to excuse your failures. Forget your failures. <laughs> Just this last week I heard about anti-bucket list. You know what a bucket list is, right? What would you like to do before you die? Yeah. Oh, I want to go to the moon. Yeah, well. Well, the anti-bucket list apparently is what would I never want to do again? <laughs> and, and you know what? You're going to recall those things now suddenly. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if we will focus on Jesus and not our circumstances, we would seek to find meaning for life in Him rather than in ourselves or our circumstances. We can rise above any experience or memory no matter how large or monstrous that experience or memory might be. True and lasting meaning can only be found in something higher than ourselves, and there is nothing higher than God. And he tells us he cares for us beyond our ability to comprehend. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27, Deuteronomy 23, 33 verse 27 tells us the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy before you and will say destroy, which means bring it to nothing. 
bring it to nothing. In John 15, verse 9, John 15, 9, Jesus declares, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide, live, live in my love. In Romans 8, 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, nothing will separate us except our own free will. And who, after knowing the Lord Jesus, would be so foolish? Psalm 27 verse 10. Psalm 27 10 tells us that even if my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. He will receive me. So if God is for me, as it says in Romans 8.31, Romans 8.31 says, if God is for me, who can be against me? 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, 2 Timothy 2 4 reminds us that no one serving as a soldier acts or gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. You want to please the Lord? When we cease to be man pleasers, and that, in, that includes ourselves, right? And when we seek above all to please God, then we die to the world, and the world can no longer harm us. The martyrs of the past knew that, there were those who literally ran to their place of execution. The same God that told them in Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He is at, the work, at, the, at, at work in the life of the believer today. So when those things of the past rise up to discourage us or to rob us of peace, we have only to believe Jesus. By his supreme authority, he has declared us to be new and no longer a product of our past, but a valued member of his kingdom and his family. When the world or your experiences would set about to bring you down and discourage you. Just remember who you belong to. Let Jesus define you, not your circumstances. Always remember that you belong to the Lord. If you have accepted Him, if you have called him into your life. You belong to him. As he declares in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, Jeremiah 31 3 says, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with kind, loving kindness, I have drawn you. He draws us not because we deserve it. He draws us because he loves us. The truth, as Jesus taught us, is that we do not have to be shaped by our experiences. <laughs> we can be reshaped by God. And I leave you with this one thing. Accusation and condemnation are of the devil, as I said at the beginning. But conviction and redemption redemption uh, from God. And so, I would just like to uh, sing I'm a, I've Been Redeemed. Hmm? Can we do that? I've Been Redeemed. Yeah. And Rosie can lead us on that. 
And you know what redemption is? It means that we have been purchased back. Adam sold us to the devil. Jesus purchased us back from the devil. I've been redeemed, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. So 